kind of share some ideas that I've run across in the last week or two with you, my wonderful audience. And I get to, uh, I found a really nice big rock out here in the Kepps Creek Wilderness area in Idaho. I love this area. It's not very far from home, believe it or not. Just a ten minute drive and I can be in fabulous country like this. It's a delight to do, but uh, so I found this big old rock I get to sit on. This rock wasn't here last year, so I think they're trying to develop a little bit of a camping area, which is really lovely. Got a lovely mountain of rock over here I'll show you here in a little bit in the video. I got this book, Spiritual Literacy, Reading the Sacred in Everyday Life. This is by Frederick and Mary Ann Brusat. I got this book from a dear friend of mine, the Reverend Jackie Ziegler of the Unitarian Universalist Church. Uh, everybody loved Rev. Jackie. She's retired now. She went back to uh, Laramie, Wyoming. She was around for a few years here in town and uh, gave great sermons. Wonderful little blonde old gal that uh, had been a, she had been a former pagan and then she went into Wicca for a while, and then she ended up in the, uh, the UU. And she said that this particular book struck her because of its just the simple little everyday trivial stuff we do in life. From getting dressed to doing the dishes to taking a walk to even some of the more profoundly deep stuff, looking at the stars late at night, being in awe of the majestic hugeness of it all, from studying books, from uh, sitting just silently, and watching the birds. I love to do that, you know. I must be an old duff now because I really enjoy feeding and watching the birds. They're beautiful things. To enjoying a butterfly. So, this idea of, uh, of spirituality, <laughs> it, I don't know about you, but it comes and goes with me. It waxes and wanes, kind of like the, uh, the moon waxes and wanes in the sky. And at, at times, I think every one of us yearn for more. And either more knowledge or more food or more stuff. You know, all the advertising junk on the radios and TVs. They try to get us to buy stuff so that you can feel wealthy. And now we've got this cult of storage facilities where they advertise and convince you to spend all of your money, your wealth, to buying stuff that you use for about 10 minutes and then it's in the way. And so what you do is, hey, we've got the solution, rental storage spots. And they fill up the beautiful countryside with these absolutely horrid square buildings that have locks and doors on them. And you go put all your crap in those and store them for 30, 40, 50 bucks a month. But you keep your wealth, you just never see it again or use it. You get involved in this rat race called life and see the very idea of it being a rat race is an attitude, right? They say change your attitude, you change your life. That's true and that can go either direction, forward or backward, enthusiastic and happy and playful or miserable and positively horrible and uh, life sucks. 
but the attitude you carry with you determines your fate. Really. For good or ill. And, so, and, and it's easy to talk about, but it's hard to emulate. Well, I was somewhat skeptical of this book at first. I said, you know, spiritual literacy. What, what does that even mean? I mean, spiritual. What is the spiritual? Is there such a thing as spiritual? And I've argued back and forth more with myself than anyone. Reading the sacred in everyday life, as I, I looked through some of this stuff and I said, nah, that, that doesn't do anything for me. You know, I've had the book for about a year, been browsing through it. And other items in it really struck a chord with me. And it's a couple of those items that I want to share with you today in this, uh, in this fabulous philosophy video. Enthusiasm means one with the energy of God. It derives from root words pointing to being inspired and possessed by the divine. There's something awesome about people who practice this spiritual quality. They are vibrantly alive. A story is told by writer Margaret M. Stevens. Three brick masons are busy at work. When the first is asked what he's building, he answers without looking up, I'm just laying bricks. The second bricklayer replied, I'm building a wall. But the third responded with great enthusiasm, I'm building a cathedral. Enthusiastic souls give all that they've got. They hold nothing back. That's why the essayist Ralph Waldo Emerson concludes that nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. The way of life is wonderful. It is by abandonment. It is difficult to stifle the ardor or to dampen the spirits of people who really believe in what they're doing. They operate on full throttle. The word enthusiasm, according to writer George Matthew Adams, is a kind of a faith that has been set on fire. There certainly is no shortage of ideas, ideals, causes, or crusades available to enlist our allegiance or our enthusiasm, that's for sure. But we set up roadblocks. We set up the roadblocks for ourselves. One is lethargy. The loss of interest in life and in its adventures. The other is the postmodern attitude of cynicism, a refusal to acknowledge that our existence has meaning and purpose. It is clear from his writing and speaking that the popular American preacher Norman Vincent Peale is a big fan of enthusiasm. There is a real magic in enthusiasm, he says. It spells the difference between mediocrity and accomplishment. It gives warmth and good feeling to all of your personal relationships. Your enthusiasm will be infectious, stimulating, and attractive to others, he tells us, and they will love you for it. They will go for you and with you. Enthusiasm lights up your life and the lives of those around you. In an essay, newspaper columnist Linda Weltner writes, modern life can grow dull and predictable. Still, there's one magic talisman left that has the power to bring freshness, novelty, and surprise into your life. Someone else's enthusiasm. This
this spiritual quality gives added value to everything it touches. Enthusiasm is a catalyst for delight on the job. It enlivens any relationship, whether with people or animals. Enthusiasm pumps zest and meaning into leisure, creativity, community. It does so with the idea of service. No wonder parents consistently single it out as the one gift they want to be sure to pass on to their children. And why not? With enthusiasm, you can move whole mountains, man. You can remove the stymie that's in your own soul. Let's look again at the meaning of this word enthusiasm, this time through the scientist Louis Pasteur. The Greeks have given us one of the most beautiful words in our language, the word enthusiasm, a god within. The grandeur of the acts of men are measured by the inspiration from which they spring. Happy is he who bears a god within. It's a very interesting look at that word enthusiasm, isn't it? By a scientist of Louis Pasteur's eminence. Buddha was once threatened to death by a bandit called Angulimo. Then be good enough to fulfill my dying wish, said Buddha. Cut off the branch of that tree. One slash of the sword and it was done. What now, asked the bandit. Put it back again, said Buddha. The bandit laughed. You must be crazy to think that anyone can do that. On the contrary, it is you who are crazy to think that you are mighty because you can wound and destroy. That is the task of children. The mighty know how to create and heal. Giver of life created the world in play. And the world remains an unfinished masterpiece. That is why there is truth in American philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson's aphorism, it is a happy talent to know how to play. Inside us is a child who remembers the energy and the delight of play. That child helps us feel the pleasure of being. Imaginative play is the source of all creativity. Whenever we express our deepest selves, we become co-creators in the ongoing refinement of the universe. And this is true whether we are writing a poem or whether we are restoring an antique table, whether we're singing in church choir or fixing a new dish for dinner. Every day can be and ought to be play. That's why we play chess, isn't it? You don't work chess. You work at it for sure. <laughs> but you don't work chess. We play chess. Yeah, there's a reason for that, man. Imaginative play is the source of creativity. Psychologist Francis E. Vaughn believes is a key that opens the doors of intuition. We follow an intuitive hunch and it leads us to a surprising love relationship or a new line of work or a leisure time project that renews our soul. And finally, imaginative play gives us another way of approaching the texts of our lives and all that we encounter in our daily experience. Sophia delights in our spontaneity. 
Play is a pathway to laughter. All the spiritual traditions have holy fools, clowns, jesters, tricksters, and these tease people into a fuller appreciation of the paradox and the mystery of life. We've got these stories of the Zen masters, of the Hasidic sages, of Christian saints, and Muslim mystics to keep us on our toes here, just like that story I iterated about Buddha. For example, there is the Apache myth of the Creator giving human beings the ability to talk and run and look, but he wasn't satisfied because something was missing. And then he realized he gave them the ability to laugh. And that is when the Creator said, aha, at last, they are fit to live. A sense of humor gives us a lightness of being. To use the felicitous phrase of novelist Milan Kundera, Jews have such a high regard for life, for this human faculty, that they celebrate Purim annually. And this holy day emphasizes eating, drinking, and joking around. Doris Donnelly, a teacher of spiritual theology, describes a curious custom in the Greek Orthodox tradition. Believers gather on Easter Monday to trade jokes. The victory against all odds. The most extravagant joke of all took place on Easter Sunday. Jesus over death. The community of the faithful enters into the spirit of the season by sharing stories with unexpected endings, surprise flourishes, and a sense of humor. Jan Stewart, who writes about rituals, is not surprised that churches have potluck suppers. Celebration, she suggests, is a kind of a food we all need in our lives. And each individual brings a special recipe or an offering so that all together, when we gather together as a people, we make a great feast. As Martin Luther, leader of the Protestant Reformation, said in his table talk, Our loving God wills that we eat, drink, and be merry, because life is a celebration truly. That's why enjoying it with enthusiasm, happiness, joy, and play is such a fantastic way to be, right? Yeah, yeah. Playing around is a good and holy thing. Don't ever let anyone tell you otherwise. It enables us to express ourselves creatively, to use our intuition and imagination, to savor pleasure when we get it, and the lightness of being, and to make our humble contribution to the unfinished masterpiece of this world. So those are some of the ideas that I found in this really delightful book, Spiritual Literacy reading the sacred in everyday life because that's how I approach my chess. I've noticed there's been several people through the years who said, wow, man, your enthusiasm is over the top and exciting and fun, and it makes learning chess for us beginners and intermediates much more enjoyable of an experience, and I've got hundreds of testimonials of people who say, I've helped them build their chess knowledge up from beginner all the way up to they've claimed they're at 2,000 now. I'm helping you more than I'm helping myself, <laughs> which is wonderful. So the takeaway of all this is every day above ground beats being below ground. Cherish your time. Yeah. Because it is limited. Look, 
My hair is turning grayer and grayer, I've noticed, as I look in the mirror and shave. <laughs> I'm kidding, no, yeah, right. I don't dare go to the barber because of the COVID, and so I'm gonna ponytail my hair here in a little while. As long as I keep it looking nice, my boss is fine with that. But the changes indicating that I am accumulating days in my life are becoming more and more obvious. And with this change comes, I think, a responsibility to leave the world a better place than what I found. To help improve people in a way that perhaps I can do with a, with a fun, spiritual, laughing manner. Chess is such a fantastic game is so much pleasurable and fun to play that that is probably one of the reasons why I am so enthusiastic about chess. It's not about showing you how good and great and glorious and all powerful I am. That has nothing to do with it. Yes, I'm trying to improve, sure. But I'm learning how to share and my receiving is a thousandfold Look at all the wonderful friends I have worldwide. I mean, you guys got together and produced a Backyard Professor Fan Chess Club <laughs> on leeches. I never expected anything like that. So thank you and look forward to a lot more chess videos because I've got several of them coming up and I'm going to do another one this weekend right after this philosophy got a great game to show you. I have hundreds of great games to show you. I am playing through the Grandmaster games because that's one of the best ways to really get good at chess and I'm just sharing the information with you as I discover it and as it helps me learn and improve. I figure, hey, there's a lot of people in the world who might enjoy this and sure enough, here you are. So we're sharing this journey together, really truly. Not as egos trying to best everybody all the time and brag, look how great and glorious I am. You people are beneath me. Recognize my majesty. Now that misses the whole point. <laughs> it really does. One, I'm never gonna have very much majesty anyway. <laughs> now nah, the, uh, the joy and the enthusiasm and the thrill and the fun and the pleasure, the real goodness of all of this is making friends worldwide. Having a good laugh, having a good cry, getting my butt trounced in a game of chess, and then turning around and trouncing someone else's butt and saying, hey, nothing personal, look, here's what you did wrong, and so on and so forth. And then you return the favors to me, and we all kind of spiral together upward, improving our lives and recognizing that through this game of chess, we can see improvement as we apply it. Generalize that, step back from that, generalize it and recognize sincerely, we can do this same thing in any part of our lives that we want to. And that's the power and beauty. Life is terrific. I love it. You love it. So that's, that's my philosophy for today. I'm in a good mood. It's a beautiful day. The fire smoke has cleared out. Uh, I'm up here at Kepp's Crossing with the, uh, I've been showing you Willow Creek, a beautiful little place. I love to come up here and meditate a lot. I love to come up here and play chess. And I love to come up here and philosophize with you, my wonderful audience. I thank you, really seriously. You are terrific. I enjoy 
being a clown for you. I do. I enjoy sharing what very little I know with you because it just kind of helps give us all a different perspective. And then you turn around and share your ideas with me while we're playing a game of chess. I mean, you know, really seriously, it just, it doesn't get better than that, except if we could do this in person. And who knows, someday, maybe we can. I would personally really enjoy that, so. Anyway, in the meantime, remember, be good, do well, have fun. Thanks for watching. Be safe. Be friendly. It's a lot better to have friends than enemies. I promise. Life is glorious when you have friends. So. And I've got plenty of them online and in real life. So, Thank you once again, and I will see you in the next Backyard Professor Chess video and philosophy video.